All right, now for tonight's program, which I'm glad I'm very happy to say is being co-presented by the Mendocino Book Company. Uh, Mendocino Book Company is an independently operated bookseller here in Ukiah. We're so fortunate to have them in our area and we're grateful for their support tonight. They are selling the book Carlton Watkins, Making the West American. Um, they have copies at the store now. And if you get excited about our program tonight, I urge you to go down there and buy a copy of the book uh, within the next few days. And I'm sure if they run out, they'll be very happy to order it for you as well. Um, uh, and in terms of this program, uh, I was very interested in uh, having a program uh, about uh, photography. Uh, Yosemite People, the exhibition is all about the photography the in and around Yosemite. And uh, I wanted someone to speak to the broader history of photography in Yosemite. And initially I thought um, I'd like a kind of a long sprawling look, uh, kind of a chrono chronological look from Watkins to Edward Moybridge to uh, uh, Ansel Adams and um, all the way up to contemporary times, artists like Richard Mizrach. Um, but I failed at doing that. Uh, however, however, I think I succeeded in bringing home something that is even more special, and that is tonight's program with Tyler Green. Uh, and I'd like to give a shout out to Jenny Watts, a longtime uh, curator at the Huntington Library, who um, I had an exchange with her, and she actually gave me the suggestion to reach out to Tyler because he could do a really fabulous program about Carlton Watkins. Uh, so thank you, Jenny. Tyler Green is our guest tonight, and he is the author of the book, Carlton Watkins, Making the West American. Looks like that. Published in 2018 and is now in paperback. Among the awards he received for this book was a gold medal for contributions to publishing at the 2018 California Book Awards. The book also received high praise from many critics including Christopher Knight of the Los Angeles Times, who called it fascinating and indispensable, and referenced that prior to its publication, quote, the lack of, what, of a Watkins biography was a gaping hole in our historical understanding of American art. I, I personally, I have thoroughly enjoyed reading this book, not only for its depth of exploration into the subject, but because of its graceful prose and his artfulness in storytelling. It is an incredibly well-written book. Tyler Green is in the finishing stages of his second book titled Emerson's Nature and the Artists, which reproduces Ralph Waldo Emerson's famous 1836 essay, Nature, and the influence it had on artists of the time in advocating for the preservation of early America's landscape. And there's a third book on the way, which sounds an awful life, lot like a sequel to the Carlton Watkins book, titled The Battle of Yosemite, The Civil War, Lincoln, and the Invention of National Parks. Finally, uh, Tyler has been the producer and host of the Modern Art Notes podcast, beginning, I think it's beginning its 11th year. The podcast is now up to 490 episodes, each roughly an hour long. Uh, in these podcasts, Tyler interviews contemporary artists, curators, conservators, and historians. Uh, over the past two weeks, I've been listening to some of the po podcast episodes, and I found them to be incredibly enlightening and entertaining. You can learn more about the podcast and all his other projects by visiting tylergreen.com. Uh, Tyler is joining us tonight from his home in Asheville, North Carolina, so he is three hours ahead of us, and I want to thank him again for joining us at his late hour. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming to our virtual stage, Tyler Green. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. Uh, I will note two things before I start. One, we are having our first um, thunderstorm of, of the year um, at this very moment. And about every 45 seconds, there's lightning going off outside my window. Um, I, I, I hope we're um, not going to disappear from the um, interwebs here. Um, and secondly, we'll, uh, we'll be taking questions at the end. Um, 
uh, Watkins was uh, in, in Mendocino in 1863. And so if anybody has um, questions about that, I've got images uh, from that trip ready to go as well. Um, Carlton Watkins, um, who was he? He was um, a photographer active between the late 1850s and the early 1890s, which meant he had an unusually long career for, for the 19th century. He's considered by most historians of photography the most, uh, the, the, the greatest photographer of the 19th century anywhere in the world. Um, and I think he's the most influential American artist of the 19th century. Um, the book chronicles about 23 reasons why, the one we're gonna talk about tonight is Yosemite. Um, you, uh, Wat you, Watkins and Yosemite made each other. Um, before Watkins goes to Yosemite for the first time in 1861, um, a couple dozen people visited a year. By the end of the 1860s, thousands are going each year, and that's because of Watkins's pictures. Watkins's pictures, which we'll be seeing in a moment, um, more than any other single factor, um, motivated the preservation of Yosemite, the first landscape to be so, or the first patch of land to be so preserved by a federal government, um, uh, and, and, the, and, and thus the invention of the National Park. Um, that whole project was a civil war project and a project related to the uh, really the political transformation of California. And so I'll tell a bit of that story quickly. It's in the book um, and is the subject of my forthcoming book, which is like 20, 24, 25 ish. Um, um, and we got to go back to the 1850s to understand how it is that an artist's pictures could change California so much and, and lead to the invention of the National Park. Um, 1850s California was dominated by uh, Democrats, the Democratic Party, and by Southerners. Um, in the 1859 gubernatorial election in California, Democrats won 90% of the vote. Um, a Republican um, candidate won only 9% of the vote. Um, he was so inconsequential that um, San Francisco newspapers misspelled his name, um, uh, citing him, his losing self. This was the fifth time he'd lost, lost a statewide election as Leland Sanford. Um, and of course, he, he was in actuality Leland Stanford. And on his sixth try at statewide office, he would be elected governor a few years later. Um, so we start with this guy on, who's, who's on our screen now, um, and he, uh, his name is Edward Dickinson Bacon and uh, Baker, and he's one of Abraham Lincoln's best friends, going back to their time together in Illinois in the 1840s um, and, or, and very early 1850s. Baker um, was uh, just uh, after I think Lincoln was um, a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, moves to California to do two things. One, to, to all but found California's Republican Party. Uh, of course, the Republican Party in those days was the Progressive Party. Um, the Democratic Party was the conservative, um, strongly in many parts of the country, pro-slavery country. Um, Baker moved to California for two reasons, to, to start the Republican Party and hopefully to get elected senator um, and to play poker. Um, Baker loved playing cards um, and um, ran up some wild debts in so doing. Um, Baker was an infamously sloppy dresser. This must have been his only good suit. Um, Baker, uh, so, so when Abraham Lincoln is nominated by Republicans in, in Chicago in 1860 to be their presidential candidate, no one thinks that he has any chance to win the state of California, none. Um, John C. Fremont had, um, who, who lived in California, we'll talk more about him in a minute, had been the 1856 Republican nominee and Fremont carried just, what was it, 18, 19% of the vote in California as the Republican standard bearer in 1856. Republicans just were a non-factor. So Baker, in trying to excite a Democratic and Southern dominated state to Lincoln, gives a speech in San Francisco 11 days before the 1860 election. And sure, he asks Californians to vote for Lincoln and to vote the Republican ticket for reasons, all, all the reasons people wanted uh, to support Lincoln um, in the West. Um, the possibility of a Homestead Act, a, a transcontinental railroad, um, immigration reform. 
um, Baker ticked through these uh, policy positions kind of because he had to. Um, it's what you did. Um, but about three quarters of the way through his speech, he gave Californians another reason to vote for Lincoln um, and the Republicans. And it was a really unusual reason. Um, understanding that a vote for Lincoln was effectively a vote for union, to hold the union together. Uh, Baker told Californians that they should prefer to ally with the North than with the Democratic Party in the South because it was the North that wrote the nation's literature. It was the North who wrote the nation's history. It was the North who wrote America's poetry. It was the North that made America's art. Um, Baker was in 1860 looking out at a state that had existed at that point for 10 years and one month. Most of the people he was speaking to owed everything they had to the gold mining industry and the timber industries. California was a dirty, extractive state. Um, California was a place you went to, stayed for a couple of years, made as much money as you could, and then went home. And so here's Baker up in front of Californians telling them to vote for Lincoln and the union so that the state could produce culture and thus be aligned with the North, which produced the nation's culture. It was a wild idea and even more wild, it worked. Lincoln won California by 733 votes out of about 140,000 cast. Um, Baker's speech that night was aimed at Californians, of course, and it would be reproduced in newspapers up, up and down the state. But when Baker was summoning Californians to culture, to the production of culture, he was talking to two particular people in his audience. And they understood that right away. One of them was this woman, the great, the very great Jesse Benton Fremont, the wife of John C. Fremont, the pathfinder. Um, John was impetuous and stupid. Jeff, Jesse was careful and smart. Um, this is a photograph Carlton Watkins took of her outside her home at Black Point near modern day Fort Mason, basically where modern day Fort Mason is in San Francisco. Um, and uh, Jesse had about a 16 acre plot. They owned a gold mine. It did well, at least for a time. Um, the photographs Watkins made of Jesse in 1860 are the only photographs for which she sat in California. She hated being photographed. Jesse's husband, John, um, was uh, most of the time busy at, at the gold mining ranch um, in the southern Sierra, central to southern Sierra, a gold mining ranch called Las Mariposas, um, leaving her um, all by her lonesome in, in, in the house on the point. Um, Jesse, who was not without her charms, made a friend. This is him. Um, his name was Thomas Starr King, um, and he had... Uh, three things going for him. One was that cowlick, um, which is uh, in most most pictures of Star. Um, I'm no expert in cowlicks, but I, I'm willing to bet it was the greatest cowlick of the American 19th century. Um, the other thing he had going for him was his lapels. Um, that's undeniable. And the third thing he had going for him is that he was at that moment, um, upon arriving in California in the spring of 1860, the most famous man ever, with the possible exception of Fremont, of course, um, John Fremont, of course, most famous man to um, have moved to and live in California. Uh, Star King was an acolyte, a disciple of Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, a prominent Unitarian minister in, um, uh, in Boston. Um, well known for his many years of writing essays about the White Mountains um, in New Hampshire, um, a friend of artists, collector of art, um, uh, just an all around, um, uh, you know, a, a, a crucially important second generation transcendentalist. It is Star King who brings transcendentalism and Emerson's ideas to the West. Star King um, is married to this woman, Julia Wigan. Um, you may have noticed a trend here. Star, um, Star was into baggy clothing before it was hip. Um, that's basically because he was about five feet tall and weighed about 100 pounds. It was all he could wear. Um, this photograph uh, gives us a hint of why Star King will die young in 1864. Um, note that he's wearing gloves on his hands. Um, Star King was almost certainly tubercular. 
and the his, his frequent glove wearing in photographs suggests he um, had tuberculosis of the hand. Um, Star and Jesse became very good friends. They were the only two people. And oh, and here's Star's book. This is the White Hills. Um, this was, this went through eleven printings um, in the 1850s and in the, in the late 1850s and 60s. It was um, a very very popular guidebook. Um, work of art criticism, work of poetry criticism, um, and a, 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 an application of Emerson's ideas to a specific landscape. Um, Star King and Jesse were besties, um, and they definitely might have been more than that. Um, uh, they, were, they, they both loved poetry. They both loved art. They were both friends with poets and artists, some of the same poets and artists. They had their friendships with John Greenleaf Whittier and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in common. Um, and they were also the by 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 far and away, especially considering that Leland Stanford did not did nothing but lose elections in those days. They were by far the most prominent Republicans and most nationally famous Republicans in the state of California. And at a salon at, at Jesse's home in Black Point, they begin they take Baker's instruction to culture seriously, and they begin to plot ways to align vagrant California, a California, a state that was in grave danger of seceding from the Union should Lincoln be elected president, not, not, not to join the Confederacy, but to start an independent Pacific Republic, as it was called at the time, uh, to try to forge connections that would strengthen bonds between California and the North, um, that would make it harder for California to succeed. I'm sorry, secede. Um, so Starr has this idea that um, he will write essays introducing Yosemite to the East Coast, um, and he does, and they run um, in the Boston Evening Transcript, the important liberal newspaper in the Northeast, in um, the summer and fall, I'm sorry, in the fall and winter of, of 1860 and 61, and they run in the transcript just as states begin seceding from the Union. Um, and so that was one, one key effort to introduce Yosemite to the North and to the Northeast. Um, and we don't exactly know why Watkins decided to go to Yosemite the following summer in 1861, but it was, you know, 99.9999% sure that um, Star King and Jesse um, helped encourage him. Um, at the time, the um, Watkins was not the first photographer to go to Yosemite. Um, Watkins gets there in the summer of 61. I'm going to show you a couple pictures taken by the first photographer to go to Yosemite. His name was Charles Leander Weed. Um, I've included the color grid and the shading grid here on the right hand, so you can see that this picture really is faded and is pretty true to um, true to real. I'll do that on a couple pictures as as we go along. Um, Weed was um, very good at being first to lots of places, but he was certainly not a great photographer. He was a good photographer, um, and so he goes to Yosemite in 1851 and makes. Um, uh, a number of pictures that are about 10 by 13 inches, 130 square inches of, of Yosemite. Um, uh, here's here's Half Dome, for example, from the valley floor. Um, these pictures, when exhibited in San Francisco and Sacramento in 59 and 60, it must be said, aroused no great excitement. Perhaps you can see why. Um, they also did not motivate any other photographer in San Francisco to go to Yosemite in, in the summer of 1860, it must be said. Um, uh, you know, these pictures are at the Bancroft Library. There are a few others um, from 1859 that we'd made around the country. But, you know, they're not great, right? Um, so in 1861, um, so, so here's Watkins in Yosemite, 1861, by the way. Um, just because I can never resist doing this. Here's Watkins. There's Weed. You know, there's a reason that Watkins' pictures had impacts that Weed's did not. Um, we don't know. Watkins, it was typical in 1860 to go to Yosemite um, in a group of, say, five or six or seven people with maybe an average of a mule, one mule per person carrying your supplies, your meat, your, your cookery items, a gun, that kind of thing. Um, Watkins, when he goes to Yosemite, he goes with a camera roughly the size of your refrigerator, um, with glass plates, uh, four times, almost four, th three, three to four times the size of weeds. Weeds glass plates weighed about a pound, I think, pound each. Watkins weighed, you know, three or four pounds each. 
Watkins had to travel with hundreds of pounds of chemicals to make these pictures. So while most people went to Yosemite with one mule, Watkins went with 12 or 13. It was quite an expedition. Um, nobody um, in America had ever done anything like what Carlton Watkins, who at that point had only been working as a photographer professionally outdoors for two or three years, did in 1861. Um, Watkins will make 34 what are called mammoth plate photographs in Yosemite in the summer of 1861 and lots of stereographs, up to 100 stereographs. Mammoth plate pictures are about 20-ish by 24-ish um, inches, um, around 400 square inches. Um, Watkins's idea was to make these enormous pictures so that they would hang on a wall and compete with painting. We'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Um, he travels throughout the valley floor um, over the course of uh, about four months, um, making making just you know really the first great American pictures of, of the 19th century. Um, you'll notice in these pictures that the trees appear to be holding perfectly still. Um, when Watkins made one of these pictures, he had to remove the lens cap from the lens for you know, two, three, four minutes, um, a very, very long exposure. It's why the water looks like that. But it's pretty remarkable that the leaves are holding still. So why is that? How did he do that? Um, Peter Palmquist, the great um, of Western photography, um, who, who died about a decade ago, um, who, who lived near y'all in Arcadia. Um, posited that Watkins made these pictures pretty darn close to first light in the morning. Um, so he would have set up his his tripod um, on one bank of the Merced River in this picture um, or on a rock uh, below the falls in this picture, probably the night before, um, would have awakened at first light and rushed out um, to make these pictures. Um, this is one of my favorites of three brothers um, with the Merced River in the foreground. One of the ways Watkins um, and his friends started to see um, landscape in, in, in 1861 is um, as a metaphorical address of America, of the idea of the American nation, republicanism, smaller republicanism. Um, and at this particular moment of union, um, Poetry uh, in 1861 is to America's cultural and political discourse. When Watkins left for Yosemite in 1861, he knew that Oliver Wendell Holmes had just written a poem called Brother Jonathan, uh, Brother Jonathan's Last Lament for Sister Caroline. Brother Jonathan was uh, kind of slang for a Northeasterner for a Yankee. Sister Caroline was slang for um, a Carolinian, Carolinian. You'd think I'd know that given that I live in a Carolina. Um, uh, SC, Sister Caroline, South Carolina. Um, and across the poem, Holmes extends um, a metaphor for the construction of land into a metaphor for union. This, was, this had been very common in the 15 years prior, 20 years prior in American culture. And Holmes write, writes about how the union of ocean, lake, sky, um, could not be broken even by Sister Caroline's deceit. Um, elsewhere in the poem, Holmes points out that metaphors were where, uh, the mountains were where liberty lived. Um, it was commonly understood in the America of the late 1850s that slavery thrived in the flatlands of the South, but as the South in uh, Northwestern South Carolina and Eastern Tennessee and Western North Carolina rose into mountains, that slavery did not thrive in the mountains. Mountains were thus a popular metaphor for free land, for free soil, um, for, for liberty for white men. Um, Watkins, in a series of pictures, uh, builds on these metaphors. He, metaphors. he, he, he joins the Merced River uh, to the mountains, to the flora, to the sky, over and over and over again. One of the really popular metaphors in um, 18, late 1840s, 1850s, 1860s American painting uh, for union and for American republicanism was the reflection of mountain forms in bodies of water. Um, this, is a this is an 1852 painting of the Hudson River by John Kensett. It's at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. 
Um, why was reflection a popular metaphor for uh, republicanism? Um, well, in, in republicanism, small r republicanism, of which America was the only exponent in the Western world in the late 1850s and early 1860s, uh, the government and indeed the federal state reflected the electorate that created it. Um, Emerson uh, builds his 1836 book, Nature, which I think was really important to Watkins, certainly was important to Star King, um, around reflection metaphors um, across 15,000 words. And I think painters noticed. Um, and as we get closer to the war, that reflection metaphor is also useful as a metaphor for union. You could not have the reflection of a mountain in a body of water and have only half of it. It had to be, it had to be whole, it had to be mirrored, it had to be total, which is how uh, many, most Northeastern artists felt about union. Watkins tried to extend this reflection metaphor at Yosemite. He tried mightily. Um, this is an 1861 photograph called um, Inverted in the Gray Rocks. Um, this is not Watkins's, uh, oh, maybe this is Watkins's handwriting at the bottom uh, on the right hand side, not on the left hand side, certainly. Um, Watkins titled this stereograph after um, an, a, a poem by Longfellow um, that included the phrase inverted in the tides to the gray were rocks. Um, Watkins couldn't, using the eh, fairly basic lens technology available to him in 1861, stand far enough back, if you will, from Three Brothers and the Merced River to get this reflection, but he could get it in stereograph. And so he made a number of reflection driven stereographs in 1861. And we'll see that on his subsequent trips to Yosemite, he, he um, succeeds in making mammoth plate reflection pictures. This is one of my favorite of Watkins's 1861 pictures. Um, that's a mountain on the left um, that at the time was, and still is um, to some of us, known as Mount Broderick. Um, Mount Broderick was a, a Democrat, but he was an anti-slavery Democrat. Um, and his murder um, in a duel by a pro-slavery Democrat in um, at the end of uh, 1859 um, cleared the way for the rise of the Republican Party in California. Um, Watkins, in every print we have of this picture, called it Mount Broderick, um, a, a, a pointed um, alignment of, of the landscape feature with the unionist for anti-slavery unionist for whom it was named. Every landscape feature around Yosemite Valley named for a white person is named for a, a, one of California's uh, 1860s era unionists, including Star King. Uh, this is another one of my very favorites. Um, Union of water, mountain, and sky, indeed. Uh, Cathedral Rock, of course. Um, I am not telling you where all these Watkinses are because they are in lots of places. There are about 30 prints of each of these 1861 Yosemite pictures, roughly. So they're at places like the California State Library and SF MoMA and the Getty um, and the Met and the Library of Congress and lots of places. Um, I mentioned earlier that Watkins worked at this extraordinary size. Nobody in the world would make pictures out of doors um, pictures of nature with a camera as large as Watkins's until 1867. Um, and it was indeed Watkins's camera that motivated Edward Moybridge to, to uh, find, buy, design, construct a, a similarly sized camera in 1867. Watkins, um, who studied at the foot of Star King, um, wanted his pictures to compete visually and be considered in the context of painting. Um, painters like Kensett and Sanford Gifford worked at about the same scale Watkins made his photographs. Um, you can see on the back wall, and um, this is a picture from probably the uh, 1862 three or four Mechanics Institute Fair, kind of a mini world's fair that San Francisco held every year, celebrating itself. Um, you can see Watkins included a couple paintings on the back wall there. Um, he wasn't shy about letting you know he wanted these things to hang on a wall and be considered. Um, ah, this is uh, going to be the 64 uh, Mechanics Institute Fair, because I see a 63 picture on the wall. Um, wanted them to compete with painting. He, he often sold his pictures in frames, as you see here on the wall. Um, Watkins's pictures are not first exhibited 
in California or in San Francisco. Um, they're first exhibited in New York in December of 1862. Um, they are first exhibited in New York at the most prestigious art gallery in New York, uh, the, the New York outpost of the Paris Gallery, Goupil and C. Um, and uh, on one wall, there were probably about 30 of Watkins' Yosemite pictures, and they faced on an opposite wall a painting by Frederick Church called Under Niagara. Um, Under Niagara is, was about five or six feet tall. It is unlocated presently. It's probably in the attic of, of, of an English country house, an English or Scottish country house. Um, Church was the most famous painter in America in 1862, and he had been for at least a decade. Um, one of his most famous paintings is this picture, 1857's Niagara, picture of Niagara Falls, Niagara Falls facing west, the rainbow pointing to the west, metaphor for, for California, uh, America's potential and promise as it, as it looked west. Um, it, 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 December of 1862, when Watkins' pictures go on, on, on view at Goupil's, is the absolute low moment to that point of the war for the Union. Um, the Union had just been horrifically defeated at Fredericksburg. Um, it was the bloodiest battle of the war for the Union. It came on the heels of the other bloodiest battle of the war for Union, Antietam. Um, and it was a moment when Americans, uh, Northerners, were kind of beginning to wonder if this great bloody disaster of a war was, was worth it. Um, Church was a diehard Unionist. He was not an abolitionist, but he was a diehard Unionist. Um, this oil sketch um, at Olana Church's home, which is now a state park um, in Hudson, New York, um, is um, uh, an oil sketch for the painting, which again is, is unlocated. Um, and it, it is a painting that Church told the newspaper he painted in, you know, in a day, in five hours. Um, and it is a call for the union to hold together. Um, a, a popular metaphor for the union at the time was was um, was ice. Was was the concept of the north? Is the north must coalesce and hold together. And here, Church paints um, icy Niagara Falls, uh, the north raining down on what is below. Um, the, a lot of these north-south metaphors in American art and poetry were not subtle. Um, and so as as and so Watkins's pictures are on view across the gallery from 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 that church. You have um, out, outside and across the street at Matthew Brady's photographic gallery, where pictures of corpses at Antietam were on view. Um, and uh, you know you have the horror of the wartime present. In Church's painting, you have um, a rallying around the cause and the flag. And in Watkins's pictures. They're on view in New York in, the Dece in December of 1862. You have what the war is about, the West, um, opening the West to uh, opportunity for, for white men and their families. Um, at a moment when the North needed it most, um, Watkins's pictures allied uh, distant and wealthy California, uh, once wavering California, uh, with the North, reminding the North what the war is about. Um, beauty is opportunity. Beauty is a metaphor for opportunity. Um, the pictures are immediately famous. They're written about in all of, um, excuse me, um, all of the big Northern newspapers. Um, Church's painting is too. Um, it's a really major moment in holding the North together. Um, at a real low point, there would be no more battles until the spring of six. No, no more significant battles until the spring of '62. Um, Yosemite arrives in the Northeast at at the exact right moment. I mentioned that Watkins was eager to engage with painting, and here's a photograph that I think is doing just that. This is an 1861 um, picture called Cascade. It's of um, a stretch uh, across which uh, the Merced drops about a thousand feet um, between Nevada and Vernal Falls. Um, I would bet my bottom dollar that this is Watkins making a Western Niagara. Um, Watkins, when he returns to Yosemite in 65 and 66 and 78 and 79, remakes a number of these 61 pictures with a better lens. He does not remake this one. I think that's because um, it had done its work. It had been it had been an alignment of once wavering California with um, with the northeastern landscape painting tradition and, and specifically with Church's picture. 
Um, Albert Bierstadt, uh, Watkins' great frenemy, sees Watkins' pictures at Coop Hill uh, in 1862 in December. Bierstadt lived a block away. He could hardly have missed them. Um, in 1873-ish, 72, 73, 74, somewhere in there, he makes this picture that's at the Met, um, which is um, absolutely a riff on Watkins' picture. Um, Bierstadt is wildly impressed by Watkins's picture. They motivate him to travel to Yosemite in 1863. Um, so far as we know, Watkins dad arrives in California in 1863 because Watkins was busy elsewhere in the state taking pictures. As, as luck and coincidence and, and uncoincidence would have it, Watkins was in Mendocino uh, at the time Bierstadt is in San Francisco in 1863. Um, while, while we're doing these um, cascade pictures, um, Moybridge, who does not go to Yosemite until several years after Watkins does, um, wa Moybridge makes versions of many Watkins pictures, turning horizontals into verticals and such. Um, he did not make a direct copy of Cascade, but he made this picture, um, which is certainly informed by Cascade. It, 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 it's his version of it, if you will. Um, Bierstadt spends much of the summer of 1863 in Yosemite making paintings. Um, this is the first one he exhibits in New York um, when, he, when, when, he, when, when he gets back to New York in 1864. It's exhibited in um, the Metropolitan Sanitary Commission Fair. The Sanitary Fund, the Sanitary Commission was the Red Cross, the proto-Red Cross of its day. When the Union, uh, remarkably, when the Union went to war in 1861, it did so it, without uh, appropriating any money for the care of wounded Union soldiers, Sanitary Commission um, springs up in the lurch uh, to, fill the, to, fill, to, to, to fill the need. Um, sanitary Commission fares um, in, in millions of dollars for the care of Union soldiers. Um, Bierstadt exhibits and sells this painting at the New York Fair for $1,500. Um, continuing the alignment of Yosemite with Union, Yosemite with the war, um, with the care of, of, of Union soldiers. Um, I'll spare you the whole story about how Yosemite gets preserved in 64. It's a little complicated. It has to do with Star King's early death, um, with Watkins' pictures traveling to Washington um, with Frederick Billings, um, a prominent businessman. Um, and Billings showing those pictures around the Capitol and the White House. Um, um, and Lincoln signs the Yosemite Bill on June 30th, 1864. Um, Watkins returns to Yosemite in at least four other trips in 1865 and 66. And I'll show you a couple pictures from those trips before we go to Q&A. Um, this is an 1865 picture. By 1865, there are trips um, on the rims of the valley. And so Watkins can can um, access uh, the rim. This is, um, as you uh, may know, um, Half Dome. Uh, I included in this picture, Watkins um, sold his pictures um, both wall-mounted in frames, but also in albums. This is an album picture. And so I thought I'd include a couple of those so you can see how they would have existed in a book like way too big to be in your lap. It would have sat, sat on a stand in your living room. Um, and they often had um, a calligraphic inscription, and they're, they're, they're mounted glued to very heavy cardstock. Um, this is another 65-66 picture. You can see that Watkins has a much better lens now. He can get those reflections pictures he'd wanted in 61. This is North Dome and Washington Column with the Royal Arches there also on the right, um, the Merced River. Uh, Watkins, uh, by 65 and 66, is making pictures for Asa Gray. Uh, either the foremost or one of the two foremost uh, scientists in all of the United States. He's the father of American botany, um, uh, probably the greatest, arguably the greatest American scientist of the 19th century. Um, Gray has never, Gray and Eastern scientists have never seen anything like the trees that stood in California and particularly in Yosemite. Watkins makes a series of tree portraits for Gray. They end up being somehow important to Gray's contributions to Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, this is, uh, ooh, that's a blurry one. I'm sorry about that. Um, this looked good on my, oh, it's sharpening. That seems to be getting better. Anyway, this is from Union Point. That's Yosemite Falls. 
I can barely look at this picture uh, without getting queasy. On we go. Um, and uh, remember that Three Brothers reflection picture Watkins couldn't get in 61? This is a picture from 78, 79. It's one of my favorites from that year. Um, and he absolutely nails the reflection composition here. This is a stunner. Um, uh, another 78, 79 picture. Um, the composition of this one just blows me away. Watkins could compose a picture like no one in America in the 19th century painter or photographer. The way the water, the, the way the black oaks frame um, Yosemite Falls as it falls in three stages there, and then your eye cont continues right down to the wagon road in in the foreground, holding holding the whole thing together. Um, this is. Um, most remarkable pictures Watkins makes in his career. That rock is known as, or was known as Agassiz Rock. Um, that's Yosemite Falls in the background. Um, Watkins was friend with a, friends with an amateur naturalist and one time sheep herder and sort of Civil War draft dodger named um, John Muir. Um, a couple of years before Watkins makes this picture, John Muir has the wildly inventive idea. Uh, I'm not being, facetious. I'm being, um, I, I mean that. I mean, it was a wildly inventive um, idea that um, glaciers had formed Yosemite Valley. Um, glaciers had filled the valley and then receded, leaving the valley in, its, in, in, in their wake. Um, the leading scientists of John Muir's time ridiculed him um, savagely. Um, I quote several of them in the book. I mean, they just treat him like a sheep herder. Um, of course, today we accept Muir's theory pretty much in toto. Uh, Muir, Muir was right. Um, this is Watkins's picture about, I think, this is Watkins's picture um, supporting um, in agreement with Muir's theory. Um, when, when Muir writes up his theory um, and he publishes it in all places in William Cullen Bryant's New York Post, an unusual place for a scientific theoretical treatise then and, and yeah, even more so now, right? Um, uh, this picture conforms to Muir's description of his theory in, in how Watkins built the picture. I detail it in the book. Um, it's worth noting that when Watkins made this picture, it was believed that the glaciers got as high as Agassiz Rock, and indeed they may have, um, but they are not what created the striations um, you see in the rock. Um, and that's my last picture, and I, I, I will um, uh, leave it there. And if you have questions, I will do my best to answer them. Uh, thank you, Tyler. We do have one question from the audience uh, so far, and then I, I actually have a couple of questions too. But let's start with a question from Tom Raymondson. He's asking, do the glass plates still exist? And if so, has anyone printed from them with modern materials? That's a, that's a good question. Um, Watkins made about uh, 1,400 glass plate negatives. Um, uh, probably, well, actually, probably made like 15, somewhere between 1,500 and 1,600, but 1,400 pictures survived to this day. Um, Watkins suffered two indignities, one more serious than the other. Um, in 1875, um, when he was uh, prominent and wealthy and apparently out of town on vacation, um, a, uh, his biggest supporter um, and backer, a man named William Ralston, um, the, the founder of the, the Bank of California, um, uh, died probably by suicide um, uh, after some financial proprieties came to light. Um, Watkins, um, Watkins and Ralston were friends probably. Uh, Watkins had just built a gigantic, I think 5,500 square foot new gallery um, at the intersection of what is today Market and New Montgomery Streets on the northern side. Um, and Ralston had backed that gallery with a loan, or possibly a loan he never expected to be repaid. Um, when Ralston uh, went for his swim and committed suicide, 
um, his debts were, were sold off and almost certainly his debt to Watkins, Watkins's debt to Ralston was among those debts. Um, and the debts were bought up by various businessmen around California and Watkins's glass plates that he had made to that point, 1875 were liquidated and, 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 and the creditor made pr prints from them. Um, and so he, he, that's how he lost his first bunch of glass plates. Um, it appears to have been a pretty legally shady transaction. Watkins was pretty peeved about it ever there ever thereafter, and there are lots of people in books and newspapers noting what a great injustice was done to him. Um, Watkins, you know, uh, put his career back together, made hundreds of more pictures, um, and in 1906, um, on April what 20th, he owned all those glass plates that he'd made between 75 and and about 1890, 91, 92, um, and they were on their way to Stanford University. Um, uh, which, uh, which had acquired them and everything Watkins owned, his notes, his letters, his pictures, um, which had acquired them for uh, Jane Stanford's museum at, Stan at, at what was then called Leland Stanford Junior University, Junior University, Stanford, ha ha. Um, uh, and literally what, the day before Stanford um, uh, was going to send some Burley students up to put Watkins's possessions on a train and take them to Stanford, like the, literally the day before. The 1906 earthquake and fire hits and destroys it all. Um, we have only about three dozen pieces of paper by Watkins's hand. Everything was destroyed in 1906, um, including all those glass plates. Um, a couple seem to have sur may have surfaced in Kern County and Bakersfield um, in the 1970s. I have heard stories of them. Um, of them existing. I have not seen them. I have sent emails, as you can imagine, hoping to see them. Um, um, I think there's one glass plate um, uh, that exists outside Kern County. I don't think anybody, I don't think it could be printed from. Um, so, so that's a long answer, but, but, but no. Um, basically, maybe only one, possibly none. Um, glass plates have survived and we have substantially 1906 to thank for that. Um, we have a couple of more questions. Um, one actually refers to the San Francisco earthquake, but before that, Julie asks, uh, does, does the huge camera still exist? You, you uh, none of, we, we have large cameras from that period and indeed cameras that are effectively modeled after the specs of Watkins's camera, but none of Watkins's cameras survive. Um, they would have been destroyed in 1906. Um, there was a, a, a Watkins show at the Getty probably about 15 years ago now that included a um, uh, a similar camera, and it's immense. Like you can't even believe how big this thing is and what it must have been like to travel across the West with it as Watkins did. I mean, this is a guy who, when he traveled around the West in the late 60s and 70s and 80s, traveled with his own special custom-built rail car because he needed it for all his stuff. <laughs> um, Kim phrases a uh, makes a comment and, and a question. I, actually, the first part, her comment, is about um, what essentially the way you open the book, the introduction, which if she hadn't have brought this up, I would have. It's a it's a tremendously dramatic way to open the book with the San Francisco earthquake, and essentially the destruction of just about everything Watkins owned, and the the heartbreak of the fact that it was all going or most of it was going to go to Stanford University for posterity. Um, so, um, but it's 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 one of the examples in my mind of the great storytelling abilities you have, Tyler, the way you tell that story. Uh, Thank you. But Kim, Kim goes on to say, uh, I was also moved by the information about native peoples that you wrote regarding Watkins' time in Mendocino County. Can you speak a little more about that and the difficulties he encountered in showing how native people were treated in his time? Yeah, that's a good And I've been working on, um, as I work on the, Amity book, which was probably going to be 2024, but I haven't been in a research library in 13 months. Um, I've been spending a lot of time on the California genocide and um, reading its impact on, um, you know, you don't 
get the historians have long in, in their address of um, the invention of, of the Yosemite idea in 1864 have long focused primarily on the indigenous presence on the valley floor. Um, and it's become really clear to me in working on on the Yosemite story that the genocide as a whole up and down the state is what w was really more important to, to, to enabling the Yosemite idea. And Watkins was not there at the instigation of the California genocide, but he was definitely there at um, the uh, instigation of the genocide. And that's because he traveled you know, in 1863. And so let me show a couple of the pictures he made there. And then I will get to his pictures of either really problematic pictures of um, either Pomo or Yuki or both uh, peoples. Um, Tyler, Watkins Tyler, goes to, yeah. Before, I'm sorry, before you launch into that, could you just give us a just a brief thumbnail? What motivated Watkins to go to come to Mendocino County? If I recall in your book, he had an opportunity to go up to Mount Shasta, but decided to come to Mendocino instead. I don't know if he had a chance to go to Shasta in 63, although it would have been a logical place for him to go. The roads to Shasta in 63 um, were the worst in the state. Um, and he may have considered that the roads were too bad for him to get his gear, gear to Shasta. Um, the reason he goes to Mendocino in 63 is he's asked to photograph um, timber operations in, in Mendocino, timber, timber operations owned by a guy named Jerome Ford. Um, I think there's a Ford house that's still standing in Mendocino. Correct. Um, and Watkins photographs a version of that house. I think there's more of that house now than there was in 1863. Um, uh, as best we can tell, Ford was considering selling some of his operation or perhaps capitalizing it further. And so um, Watkins goes up and makes dozens of, of pictures of Ford's and other timber operations, um, the mills, um, the way the milled timber is um, transferred to ships, um, the timber itself, as we'll see in a moment. Um, but as as he did on most of his trips across uh, for private clients across his career, he makes pictures for himself too, pictures that he will sell uh, uh, at his gallery. Um, uh, and he made several pictures along the coast. This is my favorite. You all probably know exactly what the spot. Um, these are the first, this is the first art uh, of any kind of the California coast. Um, all of the artistic interest in the coast, you can trace, inc including Albert Bierstadt's, for example, um, you can trace back to these pictures Watkins made in Mendocino in 1863. Um, uh, this is the Big River. Um, this uh, Watkins um, made this picture probably on the edge or maybe just beyond the edge of a piece of land that the U.S. Army had set aside for the forced internment of uh, Homo peoples or Yuki peoples or both. Um, that facility was called the Rancheri. Um, I'll show some pictures of it in a moment. Um, this looks like a, a beautiful bucolic um, picture of the big and the timber stands, redwood um, and other other trees leading down to it. But if I can zoom in on it here, you'll see something else going on. Um, this is all logging. Um, all Everything you see here is related to timber and logging. Um, this is a picture of both the forest and its destruction. Um, it is a remarkable picture. It's at a number of places. The Huntington Library is a copy. The Art Institute of Chicago has a print. It's a really great picture. Uh, one of my one of my favorites. Um, pretty much behind at Watkins' back as he made this picture. Oh, you know, let me show one other thing first. This is so in the in the um, across the late 1850s. Of course, the the the. California genocide in the late 50s was most active in the area around Round Valley um, and across uh, the redwood timberlands of northwestern California. Uh, when the Civil War started, Lincoln did not ask California for troops. There were two reasons for that, two primary reasons for that. It would have been very expensive for Californians 
to travel by ship into Eastern theaters, prohibitively expensive. Um, secondly, California was, for all intents and purposes, um, a border state. Um, Lincoln did not ask for troops from, you know, Delaware either, right? Um, or, 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 or from Missouri, all the troops went to Missouri. Um, uh, Lincoln wanted to win California in 64. Um, and he just didn't think that, you know, there, there was no reason to believe troops would sign up in, in great numbers from California. Um, wh when California activates militia units during the war, it is to fight indigenous people up and down the state. And then also to um, subdue secessionists around Los Angeles. Uh, after Fort Bragg, yes, that Fort Bragg. Um, this is where the U.S. Army soldiers um, uh, who were active against Pomo and Yuki people um, were stationed. And you can see them reclining and just having a good old comfortable time. Again, I'll zoom in on them. There are three here in the middle, and then there are two sitting on the porch of that White House back there, and there are others um, off here to the left. They're just reclining. They're having a good time. Watkins sold a number of this picture. It was, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a really nice, not one of his best, but a very, very nice composition. Um, it was a good life for the soldiers up there. It was a less good life for um, Native populations. They subdued and interned at this site known in the 1860s as the Ranchery. Um, this site, and indeed, probably this picture was pretty much right behind where Watkins took that picture of, of the big river, maybe maybe a couple hundred yards away. Hmm. Um, these are um, the most horrific photographs of Native Americans of the period, I think. Um, contrast. Watkins's pictures of the soldiers at leisure with um, the couple of mammoth plates. I think I have one of them here that Watkins made at the ranchery. Um, he, he portrays um, their lives there as squalid. Um, again, these are lives forced upon them by California and the U.S. Army. Um, we see people here sitting with their backs to Watkins's camera. They have no, many of them have no desire to be intruded upon by him. Um, Watkins did not sell a lot of these pictures, at least it doesn't appear that he did, but he did sell a lot. Whoops, sorry. Let me try that again. But he did sell a lot of these stereographs. Um, stereographs um, were the penny entertainment of the day. People bought these by the dozen, um, put them into a stereograph viewer in their living rooms. And, um, you know, it's like watching TV at night when you had your friends over for a drink. Um, Watkins in these pictures is literally um, selling um, the internment and suffering of um, indigenous people as entertainment for white people, for white Californians. Um, the um, the ranchery was was notorious. It was um, it, by the way. See how Watkins is impressing himself upon the people he's photographing here. That's his shadow in the lower left hand corner. Um, um, the, 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 these pictures are, are, are hard to look at. Um, whoops, try that again. Got one more, more, got one more. Well, I can't seem to get to it here. Let's see if I can do it this way. Um, again, people turning their back to Watkins's camera, um, refusing to, to be photographed by him. Um, these um, this uh, roundup and internment model that the army pursued in in uh, Mendocino County in 1863 will become a model for army operations in the plains later in 1863. Pope in Minnesota, for example, and in in, in the years to follow. Um, I got one more. I guess I put it at the end. One more of the coastal pictures. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Tyler, I, I just want to interject here for those who are interested in this subject. Um, uh, there's a terrific book written by Benjamin Nadley, a UCLA scholar, An American Genocide, the United States and the California Indian Catastrophe, 1846 to 1873. It's a, it's a wonderful resource to learn more about that subject. 
I would Madley's book um, is, is is very much written as a legal brief. Um, indeed, Madley is an attorney. His background is the law. Um, I, I think a lot of historians have some issues with Madley's book and prefer um, Brendan Lindsay's book called Murder State, published by University of Nebraska Press about a decade before Madley's book. Murder State is by far the best book um, I've read on um, on the on genocide in the Pacific states, and it's infinitely more readable. It's it's a much better read than Madley's. So if you're interested in the subject, I can't recommend Murder State highly enough. It's it's um, even if you're not interested in the subject, it's it's a heck of a book. Thank you. Yeah. So what do we got here? This this image, last image you're showing us. Uh, this is my last Mendocino picture. This is this is taken from exactly where the first one was. Only the camera's facing just to the right. Um, so exactly where that picture was, if you look to the right and over these these rocks, um, you're looking over there. Um, it's that beach um, where the, the uh, uh, not far actually from Jerome Ford's um, house in Mendocino, maybe about 500 yards from Ford's house. Um, Tyler, I've got another great question, um, which I, I'll preface with a comment of my own. I wanted to ask you, um, uh, what, did Watkins pretty much exclusively stick to landscape photography? Did he ever do portraits or constructed kind of images? And that leads into this gentleman's question, Maurice, who asks, Watkins' uh, photo peaches from the late 1880s, is this proof of his modernist sensibilities or an artifact of his terrible business sense? <laughs> it's both. Uh, but let me answer the first question first. Um, uh, Watkins ran a series of galleries in San Francisco in the 60s, 70s, and I guess early 80s till 81 or so. Um, at the time, uh, photography galleries sold pictures of the sort we've been looking at, but also sold uh, the opportunity to have portraits made. Um, Watkins probably almost never personally handled portraiture side of the business, but their, um, but his gallery made scores, hundreds, maybe thousands um, of, of, of portraits. Um, uh, but in terms of the mammoth plates, he's pretty much a nature guy. I mean, there's some interiors of, of the Gilded Age mansions um, built in what is now San Mateo, or what was then too, San Mateo County. Um, uh, and there's some fantastic interiors. I mean, you, you, know, it's, you know, it's like, you understand why it was the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age. Uh, gilded by California's gold, right? Yeah. Um, as for um, the peaches picture, it is, it is. Um, I argue in the book that it is not proto-modern. It is, it is modernity itself. Um, it is um, the first uh, picture built on a grid in American art. Um, and you could argue it's the first picture built on a grid in Western art. Um, uh, but that grid is not proto-modern, it is modern. California by that point was itself built on a series of grids. Um, the state had been surveyed into grids. San Francisco, um, as y'all know, was um, insensibly uh, built on a gridded street system, hills be damned. <laughs> uh, uh, trees were planted in Kern County, those, those, those peach trees. Um, were planted in grids because that was the first industrially irrigated farmland in America. And the, 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 a lot of that irrigation was done with metal piping um, and had been done um, in, in um, the San Gabriel Valley as well. Um, so the grid was not proto-modern. That was, that was Watkins reflecting modernity itself with his composition. Nobody could compose an image like him, even of peaches in a box. And that... Uh photograph of peaches is in the book, um, Carlton Watkins, Making the West American. I think it's one of the last chapters of the book you you mentioned that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll call it up while you're asking the next one. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm not seeing any new questions from the audience. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, there it is. It worked. Okay, there we go. Yeah, there it is. It's pretty great. <laughs> You know, what's great is it looks like there is a border on the picture here. Hmm. This is actually the edge of the box. 
the box is going to the very the picture. Uh, in, in, you know, we think nothing of fruit being in a box today, but in 1888, 89, that was a brand new thing. Newspapers ran two page stories on how to box fruit for shipping. Um, this is just a thorough, you know, what kind of wood to use, what kind of paper to use. This is a thorough picture of modernity. It's, uh, it's as good as it gets. Yeah. That's a start. It's at, it's at the Museum of Modern Art uh, at the Huntington Library. And there is almost certainly um, a print at the Library of Congress or the Smithsonian Institution um, that is lost. But chances are one of them has it. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions from the audience. So I'll, I'll wrap it up with this question, Tyler. Um, obviously, um, your book and much of your presentation is focused on um, the impact uh, Watkins' photos had on the creation of Yosemite as a national park and the identity of the American West. Um, what what do you think the um, uh, the deepest legacy is for Watkins for photographers who were his peers, or uh, no photographers who followed him, who came after him? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are a lot of legacies. I mean, the first most obvious one probably is the size of pictures he made. They were unimaginable even into the 1870s i mean when you when you read what people wrote about them in letters to friends or in newspapers everybody is just gobsmacked by how enormous these things are um to compete with watkins's images photographers had to go bigger and they did and they still are um ever since 1839 photographers have tried to go from making pictures this big to making pictures this big to this big to this big to this big and of course now you know, 10 by 15 feet and such. Uh, you mentioned Richard Misrock earlier. Richard's um, working on some eight by 10 foot pictures now, maybe f even bigger than that, 15 by 20 foot pictures now. Um, so that's certainly one impact. Um, another is um, I, uh, other other photographers um, uh, would address painting in their work. William Rao, for example, working in Pennsylvania later in the century in the 1890s. Um, at Yosemite specifically, you know, and this is this is something I would love to work on someday. It's pretty hard to work on Ansel Adams pictures because the Adams Trust controls publishing rights very tightly, which makes exhibitions and research um, that compares Adams to other photographers hard to do. Um, but you can see that Watkins's pictures are so well known immediately. Um, by the 1870s and 80s, when other photographers are going to Yosemite, but everybody's trying to avoid making the same pictures. And Adams is a, the best example of that. Um, of all of the pictures Adams makes in Yosemite across his life, across you know 40 or 50 years from when he's 17 years old on, he makes one Yosemite picture that is anywhere close to a Watkins composition. And that's a picture he made when he was 17 years old before he probably, before he knew of Watkins's work. Um, uh, in some ways, Watkins's biggest impact is that the pictures he made were so immediately iconic and famous um, in Mendocino and Yosemite and other places um, that photographers had to avoid making them. <laughs> I think you told me before the lecture that uh, Dorothea Lang might have come close to copying a few images from his Mendocino time, but no there one else did. There are a couple of Langs that, you know, we don't know for sure that Lang knew of Watkins's pictures, but I would bet she did. She she seems to have made several pictures in Kern County um, in the 1930s um, that refer to Watkins's pictures. Um, and if she knew the Kern County pictures, she sure would have known the Mendocino pictures. Um, mm -hmm. So she makes two two pictures that appear to kind of update, if you will, Watkins Mendocino pictures. Mm -hmm. And and now I've actually thought of one more question as a follow to this. Um, your interest is, is so steeped in that intersection of art creation and social and political impact and how artists engage in, the, in a broader social conversation. So let's, let's sort of finish up by talking about today. Who are some photographers or artists who you think are speaking to the moment and having an impact on social change? 
It's always hard to identify in real time, right? Like, like it would have been hard to identify in 1863 or 64 that Watkins's pictures would lead to the preservation of land for the first time. Um, but I think there are some there there there, there are um, there are places places to look um, uh, in terms of artists working in the West. Trevor Paglin in his work on the land um, and relationships between um, artificial intelligence and corporate and government uses of artificial intelligence, um, I, I, I think is is having a real impact on debates around AI. Um, I think um, artists having an impact now. Um, I think, um, uh, I do a podcast. We talk about this every week. I should be doing better with this question. Uh, you know, uh, I, I can maybe I can help you with this. <laughs> Good. Uh, a couple of nights ago, I listened to your podcast uh, with artist Alex Bradley, I think his name is. Oh, Alex Bradley Cohen, he, a young African American uh, painter, Chicagoan. Yeah. Yeah, and who's done a a, a lot of um, references to Picasso and Gris and and abstract painters. But there was one particular painting you had that occupied a few minutes of the podcast. It was the one that sort of mimics uh, the the Goya painting with the the, the kids with their I arms. Think that's, up. Yeah, yeah. Um, ripping on Goya's Third of May, ripping on Manet's um, execution of the Emperor Maximilian, um, which is a version at the Musée d'Orsay and a version at MoMA. Um, I, I think that you know you know when you ask that question my, my first thought was the greatest in the greatest and pretty immediate impacts i think um on american polity are have come from black artists addressing um the routine murder of black men and women uh in extra extra judicial killings by the state yeah. um and i think works from amy sherald's portrait of brianna taylor which museum in louisville um, next week we yeah, nine days, so next week-ish. <laughs> um, um, to Alex's work, um, to to um, many other mostly blasts um, addressing police murders, um, has been um, impactful in spotlighting the issue, um, increasing empathy. Um, uh, there has been a hundred year long by many artists, mostly black artists, but also Latinx artists, Asian American artists, and some white artists, mm -hmm. um, to revise understood notions of American history as artists themselves helped create it in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Mm -hmm. And I think those explorations, such as Jacob Lawrence's Struggle series, a uh, series of the the 30, 40 paintings he made in the early 1950s have been hugely impactful in reorienting America's understanding of its history. Um, that exhibition is now at the Birmingham Museum of Art. It's been, to, been at the Met, at the Peabody Essex um, in Salem outside Boston. I think it's now in Birmingham in Alabama. Um, you know, work such as that has been really important in um, helping Americans, not just historians, um, reconsider history as a lot of us have been taught. Yeah. And clearly over the last year, since certainly since the George Floyd killings last summer, museums, I think, are taking a much more proactive stance on um, finding people of color and the work that they're doing and the issues that they're addressing. Uh, perhaps we haven't seen enough of that yet in museums, but I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of it in the coming years. Museums have been more willing to be as confrontational as the artists they show. Um, the artist Dred Scott, D E R D D Dred D D R E A D Scott, um, made a work 10, 12 years ago um, called "A Man Was Policed." Uh, a man was lynched by police today. Um, it's a banner modeled after the famous NAACP banner that said a man was lynched today. Um, um, and uh, especially in the wake of 
the murder of George Floyd, a number of art museums acquired it and have hung it since um, at, at appropriate moments, at sadly mm -hmm. appropriate moments. Um, good example of how um, the nonprofit sector and art museums have um, been revising themselves, shall we say. Yeah. Uh, one last thing from the audience. Could you repeat the, um, the name of the exhibition in Birmingham, or at least give us the name of the, the museum so we can find that? Um, the exhibition is, um, is called Jacob Lawrence, colon, The American Struggle. Um, if, you Google, if you Google that, both the Peabody Essex and the Met did, did some web things for it. Um, and I think it's at the Birmingham Museum of Art right now, or it's about to open there. That museum's um, URL is either artsbma.org or bmaarts.org. Um, but if you Google Jacob Lawrence, The American Struggle, um, the book is terrific. I can't recommend um, the book for the exhibition. Um, we had one of the co-curators of the show on our podcast um, about a year and a half ago. It's pandemic time has me a little fuzzy. Um, but if you if you Google Jacob Lawrence Struggle Modern Art Notes podcast, that'll pop up too. Okay, fantastic. Tyler, thank you so much. You've, you've um, um, spent an inordinate amount of time with us, which we're really grateful for. I know the audience, I'm seeing the comments in the chat room have really appreciated the presentation. So uh, thank you so much. I hope uh, down the road, we can invite you back. Uh, when your next book it. comes out. And, I'd love uh, it. We'd love to have you. And if certainly if you're ever in Mendocino County and come Ukiah way, we'd love to have you at the Grace Hudson Museum in person. Thank you for having me. And thank you to everybody for your attention. It was a lot of fun. I'm always happy to share pictures of peaches and half dome. <laughs> Terrific. Well, thanks, Tyler. Have a great evening and good luck with uh, the publishing of the Emerson book coming up. Thank you. Can't wait. September. All right. Thank you, audience. Uh, we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.